Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth. This is the 30th time in the new count that I started with Tom Fress since our new recording started because we did many, 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 many more than just 30 sessions. But uh, this is about uh, when we came together, I think almost last year somewhere and started a new project uh, that in the beginning was called Roman Catholic Socialist Agenda. And, you know, sometimes it is like opening a box of Pandora, meaning you start on something and you don't know where that all will lead you to, because this Roman Catholic Socialist Agenda seems to have so many facets and we want to show all the facets and we've just looked into a little bit of it and for the moment we are I, I wouldn't like I wouldn't say uh, really going another path but we are going deeply into deeply into the path of false Bibles and these false Bibles are Bibles that are written on false or forgerized original texts yeah you always have to see what language you read a Bible anyway, what is the basis, what is the text basis that was used for this translation. And whether you have the Antiochian road, means the true road of the Textus Receptus, or you have the Alexandrian road, which is also Textus Receptus, but which is a wrong, wo a wrong road. Yeah, um, You know, the Christians were called, curse, or the Jews were first called Christians in Antioch, that's what the Bible says. And from Antioch, the writings of the New Testament were spread all over the world. So it is those basis tech, basic texts that you should have in your library or a Bible that is based in its translation on that. But Rome works very, very hard to destroy Protestantism, to destroy Reformation. Reformation, as long as it anyway took place or could have taken place, we discussed that many times. Um, but, but the point is to kill off the true word of God in any way, shape or form is the work of the Jesuits and is their, um, actually their only reason for existence, for, or for to come into existence. Even though in the beginning it was planned um, that they were uh, built up to defeat Islam, but... Um, Ignatius of Loyola was not able to the task and uh, you see that when you read about his early journeys to Jerusalem and all that stuff it's even quite funny read the book of uh, Griesinger of the Jesuit history from the beginning until the midst of the 19th century and you get a very good look at that but anyway destroying God's word in all shapes or forms is the prerogative of the Jesuit order and Therefore, of course, when they can get publishers to publish Bibles that do not reflect the true words spoken of in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, that are not the true words of God, but the fortress word of God, it has all kinds of complications. And it is easier for anybody else, even who is not a quote-unquote Christian or a Catholic, to... Um, to join that cult, and I use that word wisely chosen, that cult, because in the end they all have something in common. The um, common root is what glues all the different religions together, and of course which glues all the Protestant religions or Protestant denominations again together with Rome. They have the same root. You will see that in the future. And for what Westcott and Hort stand for, they were using texts accepted by everyone and writing a Bible in that way. And therefore it is interesting to know what views on the Bible, what view on theology, what view on, um, on God had Westcott and Hort, because their view determines their way of translation, and that's what you read today. When you want to bring your car to a mechanic, you don't bring it to someone who walked through a garage two, two times in his life and then calls himself a mechanic, right? But that's what you do when you buy a Bible from people like Westcott and Hort, who write the Bible and don't even believe in God, don't even believe in the wonderful word of God. 
and that is the reflection of their texts. And if these texts are accepted, and when you look at the book sales all over the world, you see that all these Bibles are what are sold mostly in the world today, then you see what everybody believes, because everybody believes that, excuse my English, my pardon my English, that BS that is in those books. And therefore, Tom and I have already done a few lectures, and we probably will do in a few other sessions, just to tell you what Westcott and Holt believe, to show to you how dangerous that is, and then to equivalent that with, uh, with Christianity. That is the biggest mistake anyone can make. And we want to warn every one of our brothers and sisters out there of that. We, Tom and I, adhere to the King James Bible. And even if the King James Bible is not the perfect Bible, like I don't even think that there is a perfect Bible, it's absolutely the best you could, that you can get. And there are also views of the translators of the time in there, but that's okay. When you know them, you even read over it. But it's the only Bible that gives me at least a good feeling in my stomach, and I know the same from Tom. If you also keep to the King James, I don't know. And Frankly, I have to say, I don't care because I don't want to make you a King James Bible believer. I want you to, I want you to be a believer in Jesus Christ and in Yahweh, our Father in heaven. That's the most important stuff. But to know the true God and to know the true Messiah, well, you better read a true Bible. And that's why Tom and I always advise the King James Bible to read. Because their basic text and that way of the book was translated is the most attacked in the world and you know <laughs> whenever you bring out a true bible teaching and you are attacked in the world then you probably know that you're right how many times wasn't jesus attacked for his teaching hey eh? think about that for once again this was a long introduction but i think sometimes necessary to tell you why we did this side road on Westcott and Hort and why it is so important because Westcott and Hort are only a few examples. You have also uh, the Nestle Alant texts and uh, you have many other people who use other basic texts for their Bible. And, and that's just the point. You have to know which basic texts they use, how the Bible was translated, and then you know, and even when you know what the people themselves believed, then you know what you are reading. And Let's be honest for a second. When you open up the Bible, Bible, which means book of God, you want to read God's words. If not, just read a novel. Read Moby Dick, read Harry Potter, read Stephen King's novels or whatever entertains you. But if you want to know God, read the Bible. And then you want to read a Bible where, where God's true words are preserved. And that's why Tom and I always advise you to read the King James and be very careful with all the others. And we just take the examples of Westcott and Hort and what they believe to tell you that what they believe is what they put subliminally in the translation of their Bibles. So beware. And now, please welcome Tom to the broadcast. Well, I'll just add my two cents and... Uh... It just goes like this. If you don't eventually want to find yourself worshiping a counterfeit Christ, then don't read a counterfeit Bible. If, if you want to worship the genuine Christ, then read a genuine Bible. And that genuine Bible is the authorized Bible, the one God authorized, the authorized King James Version. No other Bible can claim to be authorized, and uh, especially not one that was translated by West Cotton Hort. Okay, that's my two cents. Nice to be here. Thanks for asking. <laughs> nice two cents to start with, Tom. So we are going to continue today on page 70 in the PDF of the book, uh, An Understandable History of the Bible by Samuel C. Gibb, which I think it's chapter 10, where he goes into Westcott and Hort. And we are going to continue with Westcott's iconism. iconism. Westcott also had an affinity for statues. 
since his poetic spirit had the ability to read a great deal into that which he saw. Quote, Our cathedral buildings at Peterborough are far from rich in works of sculpture, but among the works which, which we have, there are two which have always seemed to me to be of the deepest interest. The one is a statue of a Benedictine monk, which occupies a niche in the gateway built by Godfrey of Croyland about 1308. The other is an effigy of an unknown abbot of considerably earlier date, carved upon the slab which once covered his grave, and which now lies in the south, uh, in the south aisle of the choir. They are widely different in character and significance. The statue of the monk, which Flaxman took as an illustration of his lectures on sculpture, is one of the noblest of medieval figures. The effigy of the abbot has no artistic merit whatever. But both alike are studies from life, and together they seem to me to bring very vividly before us the vital power of early monasticism in England." Unquote. The Jesuit plan is to introduce the way of Rome into the minds of Protestants and familiarize them with the quote-unquote high church atmosphere. Then, little by little, allow these Roman ideas to intertwine themselves with the worship service. Dr. Wiley, and he speaks here of Dr. James Edkin Wiley, a very profound Protestant writer, aptly describes the plan, quote, Tract 90, where the doctrine of reserves is broached, bears strong marks of a Jesuit origin. Could we know all the secret instructions given to the leaders in the Puseyite uh, Mo movement, sorry, this is a different word, Puseyite movement, the mental reservations prescribed to them, we might well be astonished. Go gently, we think, we hear the great Rotan say to them. Rotan was a Jesuit general in the 19th century. Quote, remember the motto of our dear son, the sidevent bishop Orton, unquote. Surtout, pas trop de zèle, which is France and stands for, above all, not too much zeal. Bring into view, little by little, the authority of the church. Not the that authority being of the God. Roman Catholic Church. Exactly. Not That's the authority true. of God, but change it into the authority of the Church. If you can succeed in rendering it equal to that of the Bible and the Roman Catholic Church, as we already saw when we spoke about the tradition in Roman Catholicism by Lorraine Bettner, they even put the tradition above the Bible. But if you can succeed in rendering it meaning the authority of the Church equal to that of the Bible, you have done much. Change the table of the Lord into an altar. Elevate that altar a few inches above the level of the floor. Gradually turn around to it when you read the liturgy. Place lighted tapers upon it. Teach the people the virtues of stained glass and cause them to feel the majesty of Gothic basilics. Introduce first the dogmas, beginning with that of baptismal regeneration, next the ceremonies and sacraments as penance and the confessional, and lastly the images of the Virgin and the saints." Unquote. Tom? Any comment on James Atkin Wiley's wonderful description here? Yes. Uh, what he's talking about is, in fact, what the Jesuits and what the Roman Catholic Church are doing with the help of Protestants and evangelicals. It's called ecumenism. Uh, slowly Catholicize the people. That's what the ecumenical movement is all about to slowly Catholicize the people. R remember, I, I have to rehash this because people lose their focus uh, of the scope of this problem. The, the Protestant Reformation was 
a movement of Roman Catholics out of the Roman Catholic Church in commemorate in in uh, commensuration with Revelation chapter 18 verse 4 and 5 come out of her my people be not partakers of her sins so that you not be not partakers of her plagues for her plagues have reached unto heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities he has not forgotten or forgiven her iniquities he has remembered her iniquities and so uh, the protestants realizing that this was speaking of the roman catholic church and which was in effect the synagogue of satan in their mind all of a sudden and that the papacy was that man of sin predicted of in the bible he called the antichrist uh, they left the Roman Catholic Church never to return, and they left under protest, and they hoped to reform the Roman Catholic Church and make it a biblical church rather than an idolatrous church that worships images and idols, rather than being uh, a sacramental church, which is salvation by rituals and works and one thing and another. They, they began to understand all the fallacies and the anti-Christian teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. So in obedience to the scripture, they came out of the Roman Catholic Church and they sought to worship God according to spirit and truth. What is the spirit? The word of God. And what is truth? The word of God. And so uh, God was working at the same time producing an English Bible because the, 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 the spoken language that the world would soon use was English. This is why I alluded earlier to the, author, the, the authorized King James Version. It's the only English-speaking Bible that's worthy of the name authorized by God. It's a reliable, uh, faithful interpretation of God's Word, and it's in English. The world was going to soon be speaking English. Latin was dying off. The Protestant Reformation needed a new Bible, and God gave them one. Okay, in response to the flood of people coming out of the Roman Catholic Church, and in, in response to them all of a sudden calling the papacy, the, not the Holy Father, but the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, in in, in 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 the time when they 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 left off calling the Roman Catholic Church Holy Mother Church, and they began to call her the Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. And this was spreading. I mean, after all, for centuries and centuries, all all the way back to the first century church, this church was warned about. It was that power that would replace the Caesars. And there were always Protestants in the world, true Bible-believing Christians that believed that that power that replaced the Caesars was the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy, and they warned about it. Well, the Protestant Reformation marked a time in history when Roman Catholics began to see it. And they came out. Now, Rome knows that this Protestant Reformation is, is literally going to destroy the church if the church doesn't do something about it. And so they convened the Council of Trent. And it was a, it was a, a global declaration of an all-out war of annihilation against Protestantism and against their Bible. And against Christ, if you if you've studied it at all, Christ is the one they declared war on, that and his Bible, and uh, and and of course Protestants. It was going to be Rome's intent from the time of the Council of Trent until Christ returns to destroy the Christian Church, the true Church of Jesus Christ to destroy their Bible, and to destroy uh, faith in Christ and return everybody to the Roman Catholic Church to image worship, 
to sacramental salvation, to baptismal regeneration, to uh, idolatry, to mariolatry, to uh, Roman Catholic canon law, to all the, all the abominations of the Roman Catholic Church. That was their stated goal. That's what count, the Council of Trent was all about. Okay? In the very language of the Council of Trent was ecumenism to slowly bring the Protestants and evangelicals back to Holy Mother Church or else it was an ultimatum. You either come home to Holy Mother Church or else, okay? Because that's the only way Rome's going to have it. You're going to take Roman Catholicism, hook, line, and sinker. You're going to do it whether you like it or not or else. And that or else means inquisition, it means pogroms, it means starvation, it means confiscation of goods, uh, it, it, all the horrors of history. That's what was declared at the Council of Trent. We've already seen 500 years of this or else. Now, we all ought to know what it is. But trouble is, your Protestant evangelical belly churches don't tell you what or else is. So that's up to me and Yurk to tell you what the or else is. It's world wars. It's inquisitions. It's crusades. It's using the governments of the world to persecute those who hold out for Christ and won't return to the quote-unquote Holy Mother Church and her authority. And they use the governments of the world to force you to obey Roman Catholic canon law. That's the law of Holy Mother Church. And uh, that's what your government is built for, to make you Catholic, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not. That was all initiated, first begun at the Council of Trent. And the secret weapon that the Roman Catholic Church used and the Jesuits used, the, the most effective weapon they ever used was what we call futurism today. That was, no, 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 the Pope isn't the Antichrist. The papacy isn't the Antichrist. It's a single individual that doesn't come until into the world until just before Christ returns, either seven years or three and a half years. And there's going to be a new rebuilt modern nation state of Israel. There's going to be a brand new temple. There's going to be Jews living in the land. And the Antichrist is going to authorize them to begin animal sacrifices again. And then after three and a half years, he's going to cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. That's what they teach in every church. Every Protestant and evangelical church in one form or another is this future antichrist that's going to come in a, re, a rebuilt Israel, a rebuilt Jerusalem, a rebuilt temple, the initiation of animal sacrifices again, which God will not accept. We ought to all know that. We ought to all know that God no longer dwells in temples made with hands. Jerusalem is no holy city. and If, if God's not in it, it ain't holy, and he's not in it. All right, I don't want to get off too far, but you have to see all of this stuff to make sense of what we're talking about. Now, the ecumenical movement is in result or in response or in conclusion of this 500 years of ecumenism, slowly bringing the Protestants and evangelicals back into the Roman Catholic Church. The easiest way, like I said, was get them to stop calling the papacy the Antichrist, get them to stop calling the Roman Catholic Church Holy Mother Church, stop calling it the synagogue of Satan, which it is, stop, stop criticizing, just call them Christians, okay? And then pay, place the onus of the Antichrist way off in the distant future to a single individual. And that's what they did. The un, just incomprehensively, the Protestants and evangelicals bought the lie. 
they forgot common sense. They forgot scriptural sense. They forgot common sense. They forgot historical sense. They forgot pro, uh, uh, prophetic sense. And they agreed with Rome. Oh, the Antichrist is just a single individual way off in the distant future. We don't have to worry about him right now. What we really ought to be doing is uniting all the Christian churches back together. So now they're all going back to Holy Mother Church. They're going back to idolatry. They're going back to to uh, uh, salvation by sacraments. They're going back to baptismal regeneration. All the things that James A. Wiley just mentioned, they're going back to Holy Mother Church. They're going back to the synagogue of Satan. They're going back to Roman Catholic canon law. They're going back to Mary worship. They're going back to confessing their sins to a pedophile priest. They're going back to calling the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. They're going to call him Holy Father again. That's what ecumenism is. That's what James A. Wiley predicted because he was a knowledgeable, scriptural, Bible-believing Christian. He was a prophet of prophets, and he saw this day come. He had already knew about the Council of Trent. He knew what the Roman Catholic Church intended by the Council of Trent, and he predicted that that Satan would destroy the Protestants and that they would willy-nilly go right back to the Roman Catholic Church where they came from, just like when God delivered the Israelites away from Pharaoh's Egypt, took them miraculously through the Red Sea, never got wet, walked across on dry ground, delivered them to the other side, and then drowned the entire world. Egyptian army behind them. And then God led them by the pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He fed them manna in the wilderness. He gave them water. They, he gave them floods of water. He met their every need, and yet they wanted to go back to Egypt. That is exactly what the Protestants and evangelicals have done because they believed in futurism. They believed in a future Antichrist and forgot the historical Antichrist, the biblical Antichrist, the prophetic Antichrist, the common sense Antichrist, the scriptural Antichrist, the prophetic Antichrist, the real Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Pope. James A. Wiley had it absolutely correct. James A. Wiley had it absolutely correct in that quote that, that, that Yerk read to you verbatim out of his writing. Yerk and I have both read his works. He's absolutely correct. And you can't hardly find a church anywhere in the world that still teaches that the papacy is the Antichrist, that the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan. You can't hardly find a single church in the world, and if you do find one, they will be so heavily persecuted that they'll silence them. They'll use the government to come down on them for some kind of a, a, a violation of codes or some kind of violation of too many people in the building, not enough fire entrance. They'll use any excuse in a book to persecute and prosecute and drive those people out of their church. And you don't hear much of it because there isn't much of it. Everybody believes and teaches futurism. Everybody wants to exonerate the papacy. Everybody wants to reunite with the papacy in the Roman Catholic Church. And nobody's telling you about it. They're just doing it without your knowledge. They're doing it without your understanding. They're not educating you about where they're leading you. They're leading you down the primrose path to perdition and they're not telling you about it. Now, a lot of times people don't like my tone of voice. They don't like my so-called mic side manner. They say, Tom, if you're a Christian, 
why do you sound so angry? Well, now you know. And it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Righteous anger. Righteous anger. We once knew the truth. And our Protestant evangelical Pied Pipers have led us away from the truth right down the primrose path of perdition. They want us to go back to Egypt after God miraculously delivered us from that bondage. They want to lead us all right back to Egypt, right back to Pharaoh's Egypt. Are you happy about that? Can I speak about that in just normal conversational tones and still get the point across to you? The greatest horror that has happened in the, in the Christian era is happening today, right before your very eyes, led by the people that you call pastor, the people that you call friend, the people that you call holy father, because that's what you're going to have to call them all. They're, they're, they're becoming Roman Catholic priests. They're going to, and you're going to have to address them the same way the Roman Catholic Church does. Now, you're going to probably gone way over what you expected or what you desired. But this is necessary information that everyone who listens to this must comprehend in order to avert this return to the papal pharaoh. Back to you, Yerk. No, Tom, you didn't say too much. You actually just said what I was thinking you were saying. And it is not only appropriate, it is also necessary. But let me sum this up in one true sentence that everybody should really, uh, in German we say, schreib dir das hinter die Ohren. Write that behind your ears. <laughs> When you write it behind your ears, you can't read it. But you know, that is to memorize it. The Roman Catholic Church teaches a wrong Jesus... And it's a, a wrong Christ in that way, and it teaches a wrong Antichrist. They have it all wrong because they teach absolutely 180 degrees opposite to what the Word of God teaches. That it is, that it is so, that's why it is so important to get out of it, as Tom said, as the Reformers did. But get completely out of it, not only for a part. And uh, I don't have anything to add, Tom. Just this one sentence. The Roman Catholic Church teaches a wrong Christ as much as it teaches a wrong Antichrist. That's the right. Roman Catholic Church leads you into the road to perdition and not on the small path to salvation. That's right. The Roman so, Catholic Church is that broad road. The Roman Catholic Church is that wide gate that leadeth to destruction. And guess what? That's the gate wherein everyone's going in there at. Don't be one of them. The narrow road, the narrow gate is Christ and him only. Okay? And uh, the ecumenical movement is the broad road to perdition. And uh, at the end of that yellow brick road is the man of sin, the son of perdition, the papacy, who calls himself the vicar or the replacement of the son of God on earth. And you don't want to be within a country mile of a country mile of any one of her churches or her harlot daughter churches. Anyone That's, who follows the Pope of Rome yeah. will also be thrown into the bottomless pit as he That's will right. be put. So. That's right. <clears throat> And you cannot warn the people by shouting, fire, fire, please get out of the building. It's dangerous. No, you got to shout it. And that's what Tom does. And I absolutely salute him for that. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for your words. Thank you for your much needed explanation even though it was not the first time you brought this but this cannot be brought often enough continue in the book it says this trend was quite apparent in the unsuspecting mind of bishop westcott quote 
I do not say that baptism is absolutely necessary, though from the words of scripture I can see no exception, but I do not think we have no right to exclaim against the idea of the commandment of a spiritual life, conditionally from baptism, any more than we have to deny the commandment of a moral life from birth." Unquote. Dear Mr. Parrott, another quote, I had sketched out a plan in my mind for the window in the, chance, um, in the chancel at Somersham, which I should have been glad to carry out. But now, as you know, my connection with the parish has practically ceased, and in a few weeks will formally cease. My wish was to have a figure of John the Baptist opposite that of the Virgin, to represent the old dispensation, and to have the work executed by Heaton and Butler, who ex executed the window for Mr. Mason." Unquote. What did Westcott say about the purgatory? <laughs> Which, by the way, uh, you know that there's a normal purgatory and there's a purgatory for children. It is uh, the limbo infant uh, Limbus Infantium, you know that? For hundreds of years, the Roman Catholic Church taught that if a child dies without being baptized, it will go through the purgatory of children. The um, what I just said, there's Latin names, I, I can't remember that. Limbus Infantium. Um, but I think it was Pope Benedict the Sixteenth who abolished the Limbus Infantium. So after hundreds of years teaching that all unbaptized in the Roman Catholic Church children will go into that limbus and will die uh, there in a quote-unquote hell of children, now all of a sudden that is just abolished. And with purgatory, I think they are very close to abolish that belief too, that dogma too. But for hundreds of years, people bought indulgences to get their beloved deceased out of purgatory. And they threw the coins into the chest. And you know the saying from Tetzel, the German inquisitor who lived in the time of Martin Luther and went through the places where Martin Luther lived and sold indulgences to get money for the building of the uh, St. Peter's Dome, as we know it today in the Vatican, he said, as soon as the coin in the chest springs, uh, clings, the um, soul from the departed into heaven springs, yeah? out of purgatory. Something like that is the quote of Tetzel. Look it up, T-E-T-Z-E-L. You can look it up easily for yourself. And that teaching does not endure, un, I guess, until the end of time, because they are about to um, change that. But anyway, Westcott's Purgatory, says the author, these Romanistic leanings eventually led Westcott into allowing the practice of prayers for the dead. <laughs> now, what does God say on prayers for the dead in the Old Testament, which is called necromancing? He said, it is forbidden. But these Romanistic leanings eventually led Westcott into allowing the practice of prayers for the dead. So what kind of a church are you in and are you serving when you are taught prayers for the dead? It's exactly what they're going to be teaching in the so-called Protestant and Evangelical churches if they aren't already. Yeah, because all the saints of the Roman Catholic Church are dead people and they are to be prayed for. Well, and not only that, but the dead saints are, it's taught in the Roman Catholic Church that these dead saints may be prayed to and for help uh, out of purgatory. That the dead saints, the souls of the dead saints of the Roman Catholic Church can be prayed to and with their merit they can buy you out of purgatory. That's what's going to be taught in the Protestant evangelical churches. 
you're going to become Roman Catholic, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, whether it's scriptural or not, yet that's what they're going to be teaching you. Rome never changes. Rome doesn't concede. Rome is going to make you Catholic. You're never going to make the Roman Catholic Church Protestant, biblical, or evangelical. It can't be reformed. That church is what it is. It'll remain what it is until Christ returns to destroy it. It is, to, it is there to lead God's people astray. And you've got to pass the test. We're all being tested. Are we going to be forced back into the Roman Catholic Church? Are we just going to follow like lemmings? back to the Roman Catholic Church, right over the cliff and into the Roman Catholic Church, into the bottomless pit. That's what they want. That's what they demand, and that's what they're going to do. And many of us are going to die for our faith. That's why my program was called Inquisition Update. And uh, all you have to do is an, is attend an ecumenical Protestant and evangelical church, and you'll find them uh, singing praises to Mary and Joseph and the saints. And uh, all of a sudden, what used to be a memorial of Christ's death, uh, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Now, all of a sudden, it's going to be a sacrifice, an efficacious sacrifice whereby your sins are atoned. Whatever happened to, and he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago when he became the Lamb of God and bought us with his blood and washed away our sins with his blood. All of that's a thing of the past. You're going to have to start making sacrifices again because the blood of Christ 2,000 years ago had no effect on the sin and had no effect on your eternal life. You see how they're going to cause you to blaspheme Christ and to, and to count his sacrifice as nothing, to count your salvation in his blood as nothing, and to cause you to put him to open shame and sacrifice him over and over and over on the Roman Catholic altar. That's what you'll be doing in your evangelical, ecumenical, evangelical, ecumenical churches. They're going to cause you to anger God beyond his ability to tolerate his wrath is going to be kindled, and not just a little. We have failed as Christians. There's not a victorious Christian church in this world. Not that I'm aware of. They all do these ecumen ecumenical things. And uh, the narrow road is empty. The narrow gate is empty, and I aim to change that, if at all possible. Back to you, Jörg. Thank you, Tom, once again. In writing to a clergyman in August of 1900 concerning this Roman Catholic practice, yeah, prayers for the dead, which had found its way into an Anglican church, he stated, quote, I considered very carefully in conference with some other bishops of large knowledge and experience the attitude of our church with regard to prayers for the dead. We agreed anonymously that we are, as things are now, forbidden to pray for the dead apart from the whole church in our public services. No restriction is placed upon private devotions. Unquote. Notice that the bishop advised against prayers for the dead in public service, 
but he did, not, he did not even attempt to discourage the practice in private devotions. What so there's, one your, of, there's your little by little. Yeah, and these private devotions are, of course, yep. led by spiritual exercises in the form of Ignatius of Loyola. Yes, how he indeed. Wrote it. But what if, if it's done in private, then no one can correct you, can they? In other words, you can pray silently for these dead saints. You can make necromancy prayers to the, to the dead. If you're doing it privately, you can form that habit. You can form that devotion, and no one will correct you because nobody knows what you're doing. And then after you've bonded yourself with prayers for the dead, then you can join a communal prayer for the dead. That's the ultimate goal of the Roman Catholic Church, to make you all pray for the dead, and then you pray all for the dead together in church. That's how they're going to do it. That's how they're doing it now. All right, back to you. Would one of today's fundamental preachers who have such high regard for the Westcott and Holt Greek text respond in the same manner? Would we hear one of our Bible-believing brethren confront the matter with, well, we don't practice prayers for the dead here in our service, but if you want to do it in your private devotions, it's okay. Never. We are to hate the garment spotted by the flesh. Jude 23. Dr. Westcott's garment is spotted to the point of resembling a leopard's skin. Are we to expect an unbiased rendering of the Greek text by a man whose convictions would rival Jerome's in loyalty to Roman teaching? I trow not. But to allow prayers for the dead would be futile if there were only heaven and hell. The quote-unquote dead in heaven would need no prayers, and the quote-unquote dead in hell would be beyond hope. Benjamin Wilkinson provides the missing link in Westcott's chain of Romanism when commenting on the revised verse and translation of John 14.2. The King James Bible says, In my father's house are many mansions. The revised version translates, in my Father's house are many abiding places. This is written in a margin. In the following quotation from the expositor, the writer points out that, uh, points out that by the marginal reading of the revised, Dr. Westcott and the committee referred not to a final future state, but to intermediate stations in the future beyond the final one. Quote, Dr. Westcott, in his commentary of St. John's Gospel, gives the following explanation of the words, quote, In my father's house are many mansions. The rendering comes from the Vulgate mansions, which were resting places, and especially the stations of a great road where travelers found refreshment. This appears to be the true meaning of the Greek word here so that the contrasted notions of repose and progress are combined in this vision of the future. Unquote. For 30 years now, said Dr. Samuel Cox in 1886, for 30 years now I have been preaching what is called the larger hope through good and ill report. Unquote. The larger hope meant a probation after this life such a time of purifying, by fire or otherwise, after death as would ensure another opportunity of salvation to all men. Dr. Cox, like others, rejoices that the changes in the revised version sustain this doctrine. Quote, Had the new version been in our hands, I should not have felt any special gravity in the, assertion, in the assertion, he said. Unquote. Doctors Westcott and Hart, both revisers, believed this larger hope. This Roman Catholic translation also appears in the NASV. 
you know, but the revised version is the first one. That's the Bible, I think, that came out, if I'm not mistaken, in 1871 or something. And it was revised from the King James. It is a revised King James version with other basic texts. Considering the Romanistic ideals which Dr. Westcott possessed, it is no surprise that his close friend and companion, Dr. Hart, would compare him to, of all people, the Roman Catholic defector, Cardinal John Henry Newman. It is hard to resist a vague feeling that Westcott's going to Peterborough will be the beginning of a great movement in the Church, less conspicuous but not less powerful than that which proceeded from Newman. Unquote. It also seems not surprising that Westcott would call the Jesuit inspired Oxford movement the Oxford Revival. The Oxford Revival in the middle of the century quickened anew that sense of corporate life, but the evangelical movement touched only a part of human interest." Unquote. And now we go even further into the subject of prayers for the dead with Westcott's Mariolatry. Because every time Mary is addressed in prayer, you are addressing a dead person. She is lying in her grave for almost 2,000 years, waiting for the resurrection of the righteous. She is not to be prayed to like any other dead. She is to be remembered as what she was. No, I don't take anything away of that. But it is not a Mariolatry that the Bible teaches. It is what people teach. And what was Westcott's Mariolatry? Another Roman Catholic doctrine is the adoration of Mary. Here also Dr. Westcott did not let the Roman Catholic Church down, as he reveals in a letter to his fiancée Sarah Louisa Withert. Quote, After leaving the monastery we shaped our course to a little oratory, which we discovered on the summit of a neighboring hill. Fortunately, we found the door open. It's very small, with one kneeling place, and behind the screen was a pieta, a size of life, i.e. a virgin and dead Christ. Had I been alone, I could have knelt there for hours. This condition is also indicated by his son, Arthur, in describing Westcott's reaction to the painting The Sistine Madonna. Quote, it is smaller than I expected, and the colouring is less rich, but in expression it is perfect. The face of the Virgin is unspeakably beautiful. I looked till the lip seemed to tremble with intensity of feeling, of feeling simply, or for it would be impossible to say whether it be awe of joy or hope, humanity shrinking before the divine or swelling with its conscious possession. It is enough that there is deep, intensely deep emotion such as the mother of the Lord may have had." Unquote. The intensity of Westcott's admiration for Christ's mother is best revealed by his desire to change his fiancée's name to Mary, as Arthur explains. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just... Ah, here, yeah, quote. My mother, whose name was Sarah Louisa Whitted, was the eldest of three sisters. She afterwards, at the time of her confirmation at my father's request, took the name of Mary in addition. Unquote. The above examples illustrate Dr. Westcott's strong Roman Catholic leanings. Again, I must say that I do not believe that if a man lived today with the convictions we have just studied, that he would, welcome, would be welcome in a fundamental pulpit anywhere in America, be his name Bishop Westcott or Hort or Schuler or any other. Westcott's Communal Living a few of Bishop Westcott's 20th century supporters know the, truth, uh, know the true thoughts and intents of his heart. Well, only God knows the heart of men, right? If they did, 
they would know that he was an advocate of communal living. Let the record, let record speak for itself. Now, communal living, Tom, this is a little bit of a stop word that brings us back to the Roman Catholic Socialist agenda, right? That's right. So I just want the listener to sharpen his ears now and understand what communal living actually is all about. What, what the Pope wants is a global commune yeah. that he's the head of. Yeah, the world is a village he's and he's the one, mayor. He owns everything. And he dispenses everything. I mean, we've all heard the, the, the nursery rhyme about uh, Robin Hood takes from the rich and gives to the poor. Well, that's essentially what the papacy has always claimed to be in, in Roman Catholic social doctrine. Every blessing flows from the Pope. You know, look, look, when... when when God rules and reigns in this world, who's going to challenge him for ownership of anything? He made it all. He created the earth from which everything was made. And what wasn't made from the earth, he spoke into existence. So how could anybody challenge him for ownership? Well, that's exactly the homage that the papacy wants for itself. That Everything flows from him. He owns it. You, you've heard the motto lately, haven't you? You will own nothing and you will be happy. That's Pope speak. That's the new world order. That's the new world order. Uh, uh, Robin Hood. That's the new God of this world. Since the Protestants don't, don't defend the true God of this world, since the evangelicals don't worship the true God of this world anymore, they're going to be forced to worship the counterfeit God of this world. And they're all in agreement about it. All right. I, I always have a tendency to raise my voice. I know people get tired of it. But uh, I don't. I don't know how I can communicate the the severity, the the gravity, the importance, the lethality of what is taking place, and to do it in just common conversational tones. I just don't have it in me. Back to you, Yerk. No, Tom. Just do me two favors. Don't stop expressing yourself as you do and don't listen to others and adapt their wishing of how you are going to say things because these things need to be say in the word in the way that you tell them. Um, that sometimes people make a comment on how you express yourself is actually a good thing because that means they are listening. <laughs> I mean, the people who, who write these idiotic comments maybe don't understand what you're saying, but they are listening. So I think that there are also other people out there who are listening. And I think that there are also other people out there who still or who are now on the way to getting it and understanding what you're saying. When you are shouted at repeatedly, you have two ways of reaction. Whether you turn away or you start listening and then doing what is being shouted. If the people start reading their Bibles and start comparing the different Bibles and see which Bible speaks to them from the bottom of their heart and their stomach, and read that Bible and embrace that Bible and embrace the Word of God and understand what it says because of you warning them to throw away their laziness in a, in a kind of way and not even to listen to me or to you but listen to God and His Word. Don't take anything that we say here for granted if, you, if, if, you, if we can't back it up with the Bible. 
I mean, that's what Hour of the Truth stands for. Tom told you many times what he stands for in Inquisition Update. I stand for that you please measure my words at the Bible. And if I be found guilty of teaching something that is not in accordance with the Word of God, then I would like to know it. Up to today, I wasn't caught in the act, let's say, of teaching something that was not in agreement with the, in agreement with the Bible. I can tell you there is some teaching coming out of me in the future that many people will not agree with. But that doesn't mean that it is not agreeing with the Bible. It is because many people don't agree with the Bible for two reasons. First and for all, they read a wrong Bible. And the dangers we are showing here with these readings about Westcott and Hort. And secondly, they read the Bible with the glasses of the teaching on they have had all their life. When you are a young man or a young woman and you are taught the word of God by a man, mostly a preacher, mostly a pastor, a priest or whatever, that very first time you hear that is what you suck in and what is planted in you and what grows in you and bears fruit. But whether this fruit is good or this fruit is bad just shows after years and years and years. And then, of course, the plant has uh, graved its roots so deep in your heart and so deep in your mind that that old tree is very, very difficult to put away all of a sudden and to plant a new seed which maybe was the true seed from the beginning what did, didn't have a chance because of all the false teaching that you hear in videos of preachers that you were listening to, books that you were reading, pamphlets that you were reading, documents that you were reading, preachers that you were hearing and the only truth comes from the undefiled word of God and that's why Tom and I always say don't take our word for it, take God's word for it. Understand God's word, read God's word. This whole reading about this Westcott and Hort stuff is to show to you what it does to people who read whether a forgerized Bible or don't read the Bible at all but still take the liberty of commenting on it. Because that's what Westcott and Hall did. They didn't believe the Bible, but they commented on the Bible, even translated it. And let millions, uncounted millions, into perdition by selling them a wrong Jesus Christ and a wrong Antichrist. Well, Tom, with that little plead, my service is done for this week. But if you have anything, any closing remarks, I would like to hear them. I just repeat what I said before. If you don't want to find yourself eventually worshiping a, a, a counterfeit Christ, then don't read any of the counterfeit Bibles. And if you want to worship the genuine Christ, the one who bled and died for you, the one who redeemed you with his blood, then read a genuine Bible. And that's the authorized King James Bible. For English-speaking people, that's the only Bible. <laughs>